I'm going to uh, talk about water security risk and growth. Um, and this is a piece of work which cuts across the ECI uh, and the geography department. Um, and it's a piece of work in which we're trying to unpick the links between the physical hydroclimatic aspects of, uh, of water security and water resources and the more social, political uh, management aspects of, of managing water connected with governance, connected with uh, uh, economic growth. Um, and so to motivate what we've been doing, uh, let me show you a few uh, examples. This is a, a set of slides which shows um, the effects of hydroclimatic risk uh, on economies. You can see on the left-hand uh, left side picture there, um, the exposed uh, bottom of a, a reservoir uh, in the Ebro Basin in Spain. Um, what you can see is the water levels having uh, reduced uh, to such an extent, this is in 2008, to such an extent that you can uh, see emerging at the bottom of the reservoir the village that was drowned to create that, uh, that dam. Um, this was because uh, at that time uh, the catchment was uh, suffering one of its most severe droughts um, in uh, recent years. Um, it's an interesting uh, location. It's the river that feeds Barcelona, from which Barcelona gets lots of its water supply from. Um, and so Barcelona being a relatively wealthy city could afford to import water to uh, make up for the, the lack of water that was, uh, that was there during this drought. It could afford to import water and importantly it couldn't afford not to import water because the role of tourism uh, in the economy of Barcelona meant that it was simply impossible for Barcelona uh, to run out of water. What other sorts of responses do we get to different kinds of hydroclimatic risk? Well, this is moving uh, similarly within a, a developed country to the UK, um, thinking about flooding and storm damage uh, during floods uh, which happened uh, in 2007 on the right-hand side um, and more recently in 2014 on the left-hand side. You can see the links between uh, the different sorts of hydroclimatic risks that we face uh, in a, a country like the UK and the other uh, infrastructure investments in the environment. Uh, on the right-hand side, flooding in the Thames Valley uh, uh, of, a, of an area which is an electricity substation gives this problem of uh, correlated risk. You're, you're, you're producing uh, damage as a result of flood risk, um, but you're also uh, knocking out some of the infrastructure that you might like to use uh, to respond to that sort of, uh, that, that sort of risk when those, uh, when those disasters happen. Uh, similarly, uh, the case of the seawall collapse in Dawlish in February 2014, um, where you have um, a hydroclimatic risk um, it's a risk here which is coupled with uh, risks from uh, the sea as well. Um, but it's a risk which endangers lots of other aspects of the economy. It hampers growth. Um, and that's the important uh, message um, from this uh, piece of research, that we're seeing a very complicated connection between the ways in which uh, hydrological infrastructure allows uh, productive investment in the economy and also the ways in which it might protect the economy from losses trying to capture those links, those two-way links, um, is, is really part of the, uh, the research here. The other important message here is that just as in Barcelona, it was possible in a wealthy economy to divert capital to recovering from, uh, those, uh, from the, the effects of those hydroclimatic events. Um, David Cameron at the time uh, said, and I'm sure he regrets saying it, but money is no object in this relief effort. Whatever money is needed for it uh, will be spent. Um, and that's a very serious uh, sort of uh, policy. Uh, I'm sure he didn't mean to make policy on the fly there. Um, but it, it is a, it's an interesting uh, position to find oneself in as, as, as a country that uh, whatever damage is, is done, it's regarded as so important to, uh, to remedy that damage um, because it's affecting uh, growth and likely to affect growth uh, uh, in, in, in other ways as well. What happens if you move to look at the effects of hydroclimatic uh, risks and hydroclimatic extremes uh, in, in, uh, in different areas of the world? This is an image, an iconic image from the Thai floods in 2011. Um, and you can see the Sony uh, factory there, which has been uh, uh, left underwater by this uh, series of, of, uh, of floods in Thailand in 2011. Um, that's one of the biggest uh, factories in the world manufacturing hard disks, computer hard disks. And the price of computer components uh, increased by about 50% uh, when this production facility was, was knocked out during the Thai floods in 2011. So this is an impact which reverberates around world markets um, and it affects the economy in a way uh, which is much more important than, uh, than, than just uh, the local uh, economy in Thailand. It caused $43 billion uh, worth of losses, um, only $16 billion of which have, uh, uh, were, were insured 
and uh, 2.2 billion of those were insured through Lloyds of London. It was the biggest loss uh, in uh, uh, the uh, for a long time uh, that Lloyds of London had faced. And importantly, in the context of the Thai economy, it deterred a lot of other foreign direct investment. So people looking to uh, build factories and, and uh, increase their industrial presence in Thailand were deterred uh, by this uh, new realization uh, that there was a level of flood risk that, that wasn't uh, managed uh, in, in, in that area. Uh, moving uh, to the other, uh, pa another part of the scale of economic development, um, this, is some, the, the, this is a slide showing some effects from the East African drought in 2011-2012. Here it's not economies uh, that are suffering, it's people themselves, up to 260,000 people dying, um, a, a, a roughly a million refugees just in this one uh, drought event between 2011 and 2012. And so the impacts here um, are more than economic, they're humanitarian and they create health crises, they create security crises and they reverberate uh, not just around the East African region uh, but worldwide. And so how can, we, how can we start to try to understand these various ways in which hydroclimatic risk plays out in, in the economy, in society, uh, in different ways? Well, there have been a range of, of, uh, of, of ways of trying to conceptualise that and trying to think about it. Um, and one of those is through the concept of water security, that it's necessary to manage hydroclimatic risk in an economy to the point where you have a tolerable level of water-related risk to society. And that tolerable level of risk comes not just from the endowment, the, the, the physical climate, the hydroclimatic risk that you might face in a particular country. It also comes from the, the ability of the people in that country to invest, to invest in infrastructure, to invest in institutions, and to invest um, in information systems to try to manage those problems. So it's a, a, a multivariate problem and one that plays out in different ways in different countries around the world. This is an example um, from uh, a paper which David Gray and colleagues published in uh, the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, trying to create a typology uh, of, of uh, different countries and different situations where those water-related risks played out in different ways. And so you can see that where you have a high capacity uh, on uh, the left-hand side at the top, a high capacity to invest in those uh, mechanisms to, to uh, mitigate hydroclimatic risk, and where you have a low uh, clim hydroclimatic risk in the first place, places like uh, the eastern part of North America, Northern Europe and so on, um, that's an area where water security uh, is uh, relatively high. By contrast, if you have a high a uh, highly complex hydroclimatic regime, lots of interannual and intraannual variability, lots of extremes causing damage to the economy, um, and a low capability to invest in the sorts of mechanisms that can be used to manage those problems, then you have a very fragile uh, water security, and sometimes you could be water insecure in the sense that the level of, uh, of, of residual hydroclimatic risk uh, is not uh, manageable. Um, building on this, Jim Hall and, uh, and me and, and various other uh, colleagues have tried to put some numbers uh, to this concept. Um, and we find a very interesting pattern that if you try to measure the variability on the, uh, on the horizontal axis in uh, the, the climate and try to measure the capability of uh, a nation to, to manage that variability, then the, country, the river basins uh, that are plotted on that diagram play out in exactly the way uh, that uh, would be expected from that, uh, that, that typology uh, that came from, from David Gray's paper. And so you see uh, the countries that have a high ability to invest and a low uh, interannual variability uh, with high incomes, they're, they're water secure. Uh, by contrast, countries that don't have uh, that ability to invest and have low uh, and have high uh, uh, runoff variability um, find it less uh, straightforward to invest in water-related technologies, and so are uh, water insecure. The questions that remain then are: What are the resilience? What's the resilience of this distribution? This is what we see now. It's a snapshot of what uh, uh, what's uh, playing out in the world at the moment. How resilient are uh, these um, situations to future change? Um, and what controls the way in which a country might develop its development pathway uh, to move around uh, in that space? What controls the dynamics of the system? What are the effects of hydroclimatic shocks if climate change comes in, for example, and changes uh, the uh, rate of hydroclimatic variability? Um, how uh, does that uh, feed through into the economy? Um, the diagrams up here uh, are a very interesting way which the IPCC in its latest report has 
uh, of describing uh, hydroclimatic risk. Uh, these are plots which show um, with that the, the, the cross hatching, the areas uh, where future projections are thought to be within the envelope of historical natural variability. And so you can see for relatively low uh, uh, concentration pathways on the left hand side, um, most of Northwest Europe is within uh, the range of, uh, of, of uh, the envelope of hydroclimatic variability uh, from the, the present day. But as you move to higher concentration pathways, the RCP 8.5, particularly around the Mediterranean, this is an area which is crucially important for hydroclimatic risk, particularly around the Mediterranean, uh, you see um, the, the, the regime moving out of that envelope of natural variability. So what we tried to do is try to conceptualise in a, in a very simplistic fashion how the hydroclimatic risk and the uh, rate of economic growth um, play through together, how they interact. It's clearly an interacting system. There isn't one uh, primary variable where you can establish cause and effect. If you have a wealthy country, it can manage its hydroclimatic risk more effectively um, than if the country isn't wealthy. Um, and if uh, the country has a low level of hydroclimatic risk, then it has less to manage in the first place. Um, and so you can conceive of a very simple model of how uh, hydroclimatic risk interacts with wealth in the economy. Um, you have wealth as a reservoir of, uh, of, of, of money in the economy. Economic growth uh, acts to increase that reservoir. And at various points, people can make a decision to invest in water-related assets, which have a protective benefit in the economy. They reduce the uh, rate of exogenous losses from the economy um, as a result of uh, floods and droughts, for example. Um, and they also have a productive benefit. If you have hydropower, for example, then you have returns to the economy as a result of, uh, of, of making those investments. Um, how can we try to see how this sort of approach uh, tells us how uh, uh, countries move around in that development space? Um, well, there are lots of ways of analysing a system like that. Um, th th this is the most simple. Uh, this is a way uh, of producing what's called a direction field. And this is like a little road map where you can say, well, OK, if you start at one particular location, which direction will my economy uh, head off in? So if you start at point A, for example, on these axes which represent on the horizontal um, the endowment or investment in water security that you've made to date, so water secure is over on the right and uh, very fragile is over on the left, and country wealth on the vertical axis. If you start at A, um, relatively uh, modest water security um, and uh, about average wealth, um, then what's your trajectory? This is like some, somewhere like California uh, or southeastern Australia. Well, your trajectory is first to draw wealth down. You have to draw wealth down to build uh, hydrological infrastructure. But once you do that, you can start to feel the benefit, the benefit through risk reduction, the benefit through uh, productive returns to the economy. And uh, the, the, the trajectory is one of, of growth uh, upwards. What if you start from the same hydroclimatic position, um, but with a lower level of initial wealth? Well, you're still subject to regular economic losses through flood and drought. This is point B uh, on the diagram. Um, those losses are, uh, however, in, in relation to the level of wealth that the country has, those losses um, are such that when uh, they occur, there isn't enough time in between the pattern of those losses to replenish the economy, to grow um, in, uh, in order to stave off those losses. And the trajectory is one of, uh, of decay. Wealth uh, is uh, being destroyed in the economy as a result of this repeated pattern of hydroclimatic uh, losses. Uh, what happens if you move to point D? Well, point D is an area where you have, a bit like the UK, I suppose, in the 18th century, uh, you have a relatively high uh, endowment of water security, relatively benign hydroclimatic environment, but not much wealth. You're not suffering losses very often, and so you, your economy can grow. Um, if you stick with point D and think, well, what happens if we su suffer an exogenous shift? If you imagine shifting your water security to the left as a result of climate change, What's the result? Well, you move to a part of the space um, where growth is slower. You're, you're still able to grow, but you're suffering uh, hydroclimatic losses um, uh, at a rate which hampers uh, your growth. What if you move a little bit further to the left? Well, if you cross that, uh, uh, that tipping point in the middle of the diagram here, um, you end up on the other side uh, where those hydroclimatic losses are occurring at such uh, a frequency that your rate of growth isn't enough. Uh, to sustain uh, during the intervening periods. And so you end up stuck in, in, a, in, a, in a poverty trap uh, as a result of that. 
What can we do about it? And I'm uh, wrapping up uh, so that uh, like we can hand over to the next person. Uh, what can we do about it? Well, if you think of someone, who, a country which is in the poverty trap, a point at uh, C on the diagram there, the obvious choice is uh, to invest in water security. If you invest in water security, you move uh, out, of, uh, the, uh, out of harm's way, out of the poverty trap, and onto a growth trajectory. But you could also invest in uh, the economy. Uh, you could also promote growth uh, across the economy, and that would be another way to get out of the, uh, the poverty trap. But uh, as you've probably spotted, the more effective uh, solution would be to do a combination, a judicious combination of the two, where you're investing uh, in water-related assets, but you're also driving other sectors of the economy, and that line is a much shorter route uh, out of the poverty trap. Um, this is a piece of work which we're taking uh, forward into policy through the World Bank and the OECD to try to inform um, how people might want to make uh, investments in water security uh, into the future. And I'll stop there. Thank you.